I'm here with Michael McRae to talk about his new book, Letters from Apartheid Street, A Christian Peacemaker in Occupied Palestine. Michael, can you tell us what the book is about? Yes, the, the book uh, is a series of stories and reflections um, on uh, kind of the reality of the Israeli occupation as well as reflections on how do you be peaceable in that context. So um, it takes place from January to April of last year. Um, I was in the West Bank for three months. Two of those months I was working with an organization called Christian Peacemaker Teams. Um, Christian Peacemaker Teams began, I think, in 1985, and it kind of centers around the question, what would it look like if Christians devoted the same discipline and self-sacrifice to nonviolent peacemaking that soldiers devote to war? Uh, so they position themselves uh, in areas of very high conflict, Colombia, um, Iraq, um, uh, actually Canada with First Nations, Palestine. They've been in Haiti, they've been in other places in the U.S., and they train people in nonviolent peacemaking to go in and do this work. So I went and worked with them in Hebron, um, a very contested city in the West Bank. And, uh, and then while I was there, I was writing these stories and reflections, both for myself and for people who had funded me to go do this, uh, to kind of report to them about what their money was being used for. Um, and it's now, thankfully, emerging as a book. So that's kind of the basic gist of it. So what prompted you to get involved in that sort of work in the first place? Oh, well, without telling you my entire life story, um, I, there's, there's a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that he wrote in, in Letters and Papers from Prison where he says that it's of incomparable value that we've come to see the great events of world history from below, from the perspective of the maltreated and the oppressed and the abused and the poor and the suffering. Um, and that... I try to let that quote be very formative for me. Um, and so that kind of combined with um, education in my undergraduate um, time in Nashville on nonviolence and the role of Christian nonviolence and Christian discipleship and kind of diving into the Mennonite tradition, the Anabaptist tradition, uh, I was becoming more and more convicted of the Christian um, uh, ethic of nonviolence. So I thought that I really wanted to try and practice that and learn from people who were, who were practicing that. And so I, I had heard of Christian peacemaker teams from a professor and decided that um, I had you know, I'd wanted to go back to Palestine and I thought this would be a good way to learn uh, nonviolent direct action from people who had been practicing it for a long time. So. And what's the main message you hope readers will take away from the book then? Well, uh, as I mentioned in the very last paragraph of the preface to say that I ask that you read these writings for what I intended them to be, which is a look from below, an opportunity to hear the stories of a misunderstood and misrepresented people, and a chance to wrestle with the complex and often seemingly fruitless endeavor of being peaceable in a violent world. Um, this idea of peaceableness comes from a line from a, a poet and, and farmer in Kentucky in the States named Wendell Berry, who says essentially, that after all the great attempts that nation states have tried in pursuing peace, there's one great possibility that we have hardly tried, which is that we can come to peace by being peaceable. And so, um, and so I hope that when people read this, they'll see just honest reflections of someone who has not figured this out on if we're going to take Jesus seriously, when Jesus says, love your enemies and forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven, and uh, this idea of turning the other cheek and this, um, that we do not live by the sword, um, that how do we do that in a context of violence and occupation? Uh, that's kind of what I'm asking that question. How do we be peaceable here? And then in addition to that, I hope people who, um, who are not familiar necessarily with the Palestinian struggle will get some insight into that. Um, and this is kind of targeted toward an American Christian audience where I'm from in the South who may not be as familiar um, with, with these stories and, and that I think American media often presents a very um, false view of Palestinians, a very one-sided view, a very single story. Uh, and so I hope people will be able to add some complexity to the single narrative that they have of Palestinians. Okay, and um, would you mind then sharing with us a few short excerpts from the book? Sure. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll share, um, if I can find it here, one story, it's very, very short, it's called um, Darkness Cannot Drive Out Darkness. Um, and again, this, these were originally emails that I was sending to people that have kind of emerged in, um, uh, in book format. But this, this story in particular um, is about some of my teammates and I with CPT um, who 
uh, were coming back uh, from a birthday party and we stumbled across some soldiers who were being very intimidating and it was about a way that we tried to practice nonviolence in a in a creative way so it's called darkness cannot drive out darkness Saturday January 28th 2012 Hebron occupied Palestine unlike Jerusalem Hebron's old city has one main street it connects the Ibrahimi mosque to Bab el Baladia an open square next to the Beit Romano settlement and military base Along this cobblestone road, narrower streets branch off, meandering deeper into the old city, intersecting with less, other less trafficked alleys. At night, the old city is dark, with only the main road lit and there only in scattered places. The side streets are often as black as the night. Three nights ago, the CPT team was walking home in high spirits after celebrating our beloved Kathy's 50th birthday at one of our favorite local restaurants. As we entered the old city, we glanced down the first side street to our left and noticed two soldiers standing in the darkness up against the wall, a few paces from the faint light of the main street. Both had their weapons in hand. Without much discussion, we decided to stay, hoping to be a de-escalating presence. Hey guys, we greeted, voices raised. How are you tonight? The soldier in front simply nodded. What are you doing back here in the dark? My teammate Chris continued. Are you waiting for someone? The soldier in front smiled. We're waiting for the Messiah. Our laughter reverberated off the stone walls. You're waiting for the Messiah with guns, I asked, chuckling. The soldier shrugged, still smirking. Kathy offered, would you like some cake, presenting her chocolate birthday dessert. Rosie, my other teammate, took off to retrieve forks from the house. Come on, I know you want some, I pursued after they declined. That smile on your face says it all. The soldier in front stifled his laughter. Chris, Kathy, and I decided to maintain a casual presence, not forcing the soldiers into conversation, but neither allowing their intimidating presence to dominate that space. Kathy handed me the cake, and I posed for pictures with Marky, her stuffed rainbow unicorn, a tool of de-escalation. Over the next several minutes, we exchanged a few light-hearted remarks with the soldiers to keep tension minimal. Just as Rosie returned with forks, a group of female Oxford students on a stroll joined us, more than doubling our group. Our laughter and cheerful conversation penetrated the night's silence, bringing a smile to the faces of Palestinians walking by. Yet, as some of these individuals turned down the alley where the soldiers were hiding, many hesitated and a few even jumped back at the sight of these armed men in the shadows. Then, as we divided the cake among our group and loudly sang happy birthday, the soldiers decided to leave, stepping out of the darkness and disappearing behind the gate of the military base. I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. that decorate our living room wall. Darkness cannot, cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And the second story that I'll share is um, one that I call The Search for Human Interaction. Um, and this is one of the things I tried to do with CPT was um, give soldiers an opportunity to present a different story than the prevailing story that they uh, they present when they're uh, kind of patrolling the streets um, with their weapons at night and harassing people and, and beating people at times, even while we were there. Um, and, and I wanted to, um, one way I thought I could try and love my enemies is by giving them the chance to demonstrate something different than what we constantly saw. So I tried to have some conversations with soldiers um, that challenged this single narrative. Uh, so this kind of uh, is one of those conversations. Um, the Search for Human Interaction. Sunday, February 5th, 2012, Hebron occupied Palestine. Legend holds that as St. Francis journeyed along the road searching for the meaning of God, he came upon a dead tree and in exasperation exclaimed, Speak to me of God! And behold, the tree began to bloom. There is no formula for nonviolence. There's no best approach or this is guaranteed to work. In my limited experience, much of nonviolent direct action is guesswork, trial and error adaptation. A certain attempt at de-escalation might work beautifully today, but that same approach could fail miserably tomorrow. The practice of nonviolence seems to fail far more than it succeeds in bringing about immediate positive change. If we pursue nonviolence in the hopes of seeing instant results, we will often be left dissatisfied. For me, I aspire to practice nonviolence due to my firm convictions that this is both the call for all Christians, as well as the only true hope for the world. Our desire is for the establishment of shalom, salam, peace, wholeness. We want beloved community. Will nonviolence get us there? 
I'm not sure, but I know that violence never will and never can. Violence is destruction. How can it create wholeness and community? All this to say, no one has a patent on nonviolent strategy. There are many approaches. Some on the CPT team feel that the conversations with soldiers are unproductive, unhelpful, perhaps even wrong. They say, these are the occupiers. Our job is not to be friends with them. I understand this perspective and respect the decisions of those who choose not to engage. For myself, though, I find the conversations necessary. To speak of practicing nonviolence is really too limiting. Nonviolence is simply that, a lack of violence. While nonviolence is a crucial aspect of the pursuit of peace, the absence of violence is not the final goal. We seek to create a culture of life. The powers of this world, the masters of war, plan strategies and tactics that perpetuate the cycles of destruction and further cement the culture of death that infects our earth. Within this darkness, we must create light. In the midst of this culture of death, we seek to embody a culture of life. For now, this is why I pursue conversations with soldiers. These soldiers belong to the war machine, instrument, instruments of the puppeteers who orchestrate real-life tragedies. Left unengaged, they cast a dark shadow over our city. They are like wolves prowling the streets day and night. They often present themselves as demons, monsters to be hated, and I know that I have the capacity to hate them. When this happens, the culture of death wins. My task, then, is to do the hard work of rehumanization. For me, this cannot happen without personal interaction, human interaction. As I mentioned before, I do not believe you can truly love your enemies if you do not know them. Part of loving my enemies means I hold them accountable for their actions, try to speak truth to their injustice. It also means, if possible, that when the soldiers are not active in their harassment, I need to create the space for meaningful engagement. If they choose not to participate, so be it, but the space is still there. In some way, I see this as an attempt to practice resurrection, experiencing life where death once dwelled. Often these moments are brief. Last week, I walked through the checkpoint outside the Ibrahimi Mosque and encountered a soldier who informed me that I had no life and was there only to make their jobs more difficult. Another soldier, whose name I learned later, but here we'll call Yaakov, turned to me and said with disdain, CPT is garbage, you are garbage. I smiled, tilting my head in curiosity. Do you watch tennis? I asked. Yakov hesitated and then nodded, pretending to swing a racket. You look just like Novak Djokovic, I commented, referring to a famous professional tennis player from Serbia. Djokovic, the few other soldiers around him began discussing in Hebrew, seemingly giving their perspectives on my observation. A smile crept on Yakov's face and he then spoke to me in Hebrew. I turned to the female soldier who had just told me that I had no life. Smiling, she translated, he thinks you look like Djokovic. Me, I protested. No way, my beard is way too thick. At that moment, we were all smiling, all of us. Moments before, CPT and I were under verbal attack, but now everyone was laughing and chatting about tennis. Other times, these moments come in the form of sustained conversation. Such was the case with Ari, which is a previous story, or more recently, Dov. Dov is one of the border police stationed at the checkpoints near the mosque and the Gutnik Settler Center. I stood on checkpoint watch at the mosque on Wednesday morning when I heard Dov convincingly impersonating a British accent. I stepped forward to applaud and was subsequently asked to try the accent for myself. I received an enthusiastic ovation for my effort. Dove meandered over next to me and we spent the next 40 minutes discussing a range of subjects covering favorite movies, family history, love lives, desired travel destinations, and favorite places in Israel. After laying this groundwork, I saw the space to push forward. When do you leave the military, I asked. One month, he grinned. I am excited. I hate this job. I hate everything about it. Earlier, one of the soldiers had asked me if I enjoyed taking pictures of soldiers beating children. Of course not, I told them. I wish you wouldn't beat children. Dove responded by saying that soldiers should never beat children, but that children often cause problems for them. The children, he said, yell at the soldiers, cussing at them and spouting all kinds of vulgarity. He told me he feels he should sternly reprimand, but never beat them. In light of this statement, about, in light of his statement on hating his job, I felt now was a good time to follow up the earlier conversation. So you don't think soldiers should beat people? No, of course not, Dove insisted, his body hunched over as he leaned against the railing. Only an eye for an eye, you know? This is it. Do you know of this? Sure, I know of this, I assured. It's part of my scriptures as well. But Christians also follow the teachings of Yeshua, who and he went even further, telling us to love our enemies. Love your enemies, huh? Dove asked, smiling. Kind of sucks, doesn't it? 
We both laughed as I continued, but that's one reason why we are committed to nonviolence. You know, even if someone attacks us, we try not to fight back. Dove looked up at me. I want to be this kind of person. Hard to do with a gun, I said, pointing to the M16 strapped to his side. I never use it, he replied. I told him he should get rid of all his guns when he leaves the military. He nodded. There is no need for them. Exchanges such as these are helpful. Like a flash mob, these human moments appear and captivate, and then, just as quickly, vanish as if they never existed. But you leave knowing that they did exist, even if only for a moment. During those forty minutes, I tried to engage Dove not as an oppressor, but as another twenty-two-year-old man searching through questions unsure of purpose or direction. Such interactions are rare, however. Most of the time, the soldiers ignore me at best and threaten me at worst. They cuss, yell, and spit at me. This is normative. And despite those glimpses into the culture of life, in the end, Dove, Ari, and Yakov are still taking part in a brutal oppression. They are humans participating in the theft of other humans' land and resources. Thus, should the search then be not for human interactions, but rather to rescue ourselves from the devastation of our own humanity? I wonder if the real problem is that our humanity is dying, choked by the myths and hatred we grasp so tightly. Like St. Francis, I keep shouting to this dying tree, Speak to me of God, but how long will we wait until the blossoms come? Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. It's great, Michael. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, too.